Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation and welcome to the special edition of FOSDEM for COVID. First, uh, quick words by myself. I'm the founder and an embedded Linux engineer at Bootlin, an embedded software engineering company. Uh, we focus only on free and open source software, so that's what we like about it. I'm a, a free software contributor. I'm the current maintainer of the Elixir cross-referencer project, making it easy to explore the sources of big C projects, such as the Linux kernel. So check it out on elixir.bootlin.com and you won't regret it. I'm also the co-author of Putin's freely available embedded Linux and kernel training materials, which you can find here. And in the previous life, I was the maintainer of GNU Typist. So before I start the presentation, as time has some importance here, I propose to start downloading Bitroot, which will allow me to generate the toolchain that we will use throughout all the demos. So here we are. So you go to bitroot.org, go to download, and I'm going to copy um, the latest version, uh, fetch the copy, copy the link location, and I will paste it in the terminal window. OK, so first I'm going to uh, record the session with a tool that I like. It's called Xkinima. Uh, I'll tell you more about it if I have time. OK, and, uh, we create a risk file directory for our work. We get the bitroot sources. Extract them, of course. And then run the menu config interface for bitroot, the configuration interface. OK, so here to generate a toolchain, all you need is to specify the target architecture. So you see you have plenty of choice, but what we want is RISC-V in 64-bit mode, so that's all right. And all you have to do is just configure the toolchain. So we're going to pick the um, C uh, library, so it's Masson that we choose this time. Um, I'll explain why. Then uh, we'll check the Linux kernel headers and Vinutil versions and uh, GCC, which are recent enough. Good. And that's all. So I just can save the configuration, leave the um, as kinema session because it will be too long if I record everything. And then I can uh, run, get back to the directory, of course, and run make SDK, which is the command to generate only an SDK and not an, a full root file system. And time, of course, to know how much time it takes. There we are. Right, as you can see, it's starting to download the various components that you need in the tool chain. So it's, it's going to take a couple of minutes. In the meantime, we have time for presentation work. So uh, while the tool chain is being built, uh, I'd like first to uh, explain what I like in embedded Linux. The first thing is that Linux is perfect for uh, operating devices with a fixed set of features. And unlike on a desktop, Linux is found in almost every existing embedded system. Another thing is that embedded Linux makes Linux easy to learn. You just need a few programs and libraries, and that's it. You can understand the usefulness of each file in the file system. Another thing is that the Linux kernel is standalone. There are no complex dependencies against external software, and the code is in C. Uh, Linux also just uh, works just works with a few megabytes uh, of RAM and storage. And that's enough. Uh, there's a new version of Linux also every two three months. Another thing is that there's a relatively small development community, and you end up meeting lots of familiar faces at technical conferences, like uh, when you go to the embedded Linux conference. And eventually you have lots of opportunities and also some funding available for became, becoming a contributor, for example, to the Linux kernel, to the bootloaders, to the build systems. So that's great. Actually, with this presentation, I'm reviving an old presentation, actually one of the first ones from uh, Free Electrons, the former name of Bootlin, which was showed in 2005 at the Libre Software meeting. I was showing a 2.6 Linux kernel booting on QMU 
um, a QMU emulated ARM board, and it was one of our most downloaded presentations at that time. This is an opportunity to, to look back and see what has changed in 2005. So in the Linux kernel, we've moved from version 2.6 to version 5.x, so many versions in between. Uh, for source control, BitKeeper has been replaced by Git, and Linux is now everywhere, so you don't need to convince customers to use it anymore, and it's even easier and easier to convince them to fund contributions to the official versions of those projects. Uh, DevTempFS Dev is new to... Um, it automatically creates the device files, and I don't have to mention uh, the mk not command in this presentation anymore. On ARM and in other architectures, devices are now described by the device tree instead of having to use C code, so it really makes it easier to port um, the Linux kernel to new hardware. In the embedded environment, there's the maker movement, uh, a very sharp reduction in the cost of development boards, there's the rise of open hardware, right? And also RISC-V, last but not least, um, a new open source hardware instruction set architecture that I'm going to talk about right now. So RISC-V is a new open source instruction set architecture that was created by the University of California, Berkeley, in a world dominated by proprietary ISAs with heavy royalties such as ARM and x86. It exists in uh, 32, 64, and 128-bit variants from microcontrollers to more powerful server hardware. Uh, so anyone can use it and extend it to create their own SOCs and CPUs. Uh, this reduces costs and promotes reuse and collaboration. The implementations can be proprietary, uh, so many hardware vendors are using RISC-V CPUs or in their hardware, such as Microchip, Western Digital, and NVIDIA but free implementations are also being created. So uh, things are uh, progressing very rapidly and I'm, I probably will be missing some uh, recent news. So how to use Linux with Plus 5? Uh, hardware is fortunately now getting available and there are last minute news, uh, at least when I'm recording this. Uh, Beagle 5, it was announced on January the 13th. Uh, so I even had to uh, re uh, record this uh, part of the presentation. Uh, I didn't want to miss it. So the first, it's the first affordable RX5 uh, board for the community that should be available uh, at 150 USD in April this year. So many thanks to the BeagleBoard.org uh, project for their great contributions to the community. Can't wait to have it. Uh, there's also the high-tickle kit from a Microchip, uh, including uh, an FPGA with 250 for uh, K-Gates uh, sold at uh, $500. There are also uh, much cheaper uh, small boards um, with the K210 SOC, but um, their support in Linux is uh, available, but uh, it's very limited because the MMU is not supported by Linux. So it's, a, it's an MMU less platform. You can also synthesize RISC-V cores on FPGAs, and you'll find resources for doing that. And uh, before more hardware is available in 2021, you can get started with the QMU emulator, which simulates a virtual board, in particular with Vertio hardware. You can also try uh, Linux on RISC-V with uh, JF Linux, which is um, a machine emulator implementing JavaScript by Fabrice Bellard, so you can run Linux on RISC-V with it too, on your browser directly. That's amazing. So, the goal of this presentation is to show you the most important aspects of embedded Linux development work. Uh, we'll start by building a cross-compiling toolchain, we will create a disk image, we will boot uh, using a bootloader, uBoot, we'll load and start the Linux kernel from uBoot, um, we'll also build a root file system populated with basic utilities, namely from BusyBox, we will configure the way the system starts and eventually we will set up networking and we'll control the system uh, through a web interface. Here are the things to build today. The cross-compiling toolchain will be built uh, with BuildRoot, the latest version. We'll use OpenSBI to build the first stage bootloader. Then the bootloader will be the latest version of uBoot. Uh, We'll also use the latest version of the kernel at the time of this uh, recording, and we'll use BusyBox to populate the root file system with basic utilities. Uh, all this is possible to compile and assemble in less than 45 minutes if you have a fast enough machine. So the first topic to talk about is the cross-compiling toolchain. 
So uh, what's a chorus compiling toolchain? It's a compiler that takes some source code. If the toolchain is native, it's going to generate um, some binary for the same architecture as the machine running it. But if it's a cross compiling toolchain, then you generate binaries for uh, another architecture. So here the difference in, in terms of execution machines. So you see here RISC-V, for example, um, from the same source code, you can generate different binaries for different architectures. So uh, why generate your own cross-compiling toolchain compared to ready-made toolchains that you can find uh, from your distributions or that you can find on the internet? You can choose your exact compiler version. You can choose your C library like glibc, uh, uclibc, or uh, muscle. You can tweak all the features that you need to tweak. And what you gain uh, above all is reproducibility. So if a bug is found, just apply a fix and don't change anything else. So here you progress in terms of uh, reproducibility. So you don't need to get another tool chain that would get different bugs and you're, that's leading you nowhere, of course. Now, one of the most important choices is the choice of the C library, which is an essential component of uh, an embedded Linux system. It's because it's the interface between the applications and the kernel. And of course, it's a C library. Uh, so in embedded Linux, you have multiple C libraries that are available. You have the glibc that you found on uh, the desktop and servers, but it's rather, it's rather big, like two megabytes on ARM. And uh, if this size is too big for you, then you can consider uh, other C libraries such as uclibc, uh, which is bet better adapted to embedded use because it can be made smaller and it supports uh, RIX 564 as well. You also have the muscle library, which is great for embedded use is, uh, and is a bit more recent and has a different, uh, more permissive license than uh, UCDPC. So uh, what happens is that the choice of the C library must be made at cross-compiling toolchain generation time, as the GTC compiler will be compiled against a specific library. So uh, here are the, um, the steps that we are going to go through to uh, generate the, the two chain. So I'm going to show you that in, in the upcoming demo. That's for your reference. Here you have um, an Askinema video of the steps. Uh, Askinema is nice because it's something, uh, it's a NASCII animated, animated video, uh, and therefore you can uh, copy and paste commands or URLs directly from the text video. And so that's great. So try, uh, check it out if you haven't seen uh, Askinema yet. Hey, there we are. Tool chain generation is over. Um, as you can see, it took uh, eight minutes, almost nine, to complete the job. Actually, 33 minutes in user time. But Bitroot knows how to take advantage of multiple CPU cores uh, to run things faster. So now we have a tool chain in output images. You see, there it is. So let's extract it in a toolchain directory. There we are. So you have a new directory in here. The most important one being the bin directory containing all the, um, the cross compilers the cross compiler executables uh, with links to um, the simple uh, short name links to longer names <laughs> right so our compiler is risk 5 uh, 64 linux gcc now um, one thing we need to do is relocate the toolchain and uh, there's a script provided by bitro to do so because the toolchain will uh, contain some hard-coded paths so it needs to know where it's actually installed there we are the next thing to do is um, to add uh, the bin directory to um, our paths. So what I'm going to do is go to here and create an env uh, risk file or risk five sixty four env sixty four sorry <laughs> that sh uh, file. So it's going to be export path equal. I'm going to grab the path. Uh, here to chain bin so that's what I want oh, sorry add it to my path
in the area. So this way I can source this and the toolchain is in my path. So I'm gonna test that um, the compiler works fine. I copy the hello.c uh, file, just the hello world one. So let's uh, try to run it. So it's grisk file 64 Linux GCC, hello.c. You get an added out file. Let's, let's create something more explicit like minus O hello. And actually I'm going to compile it statically too because uh, um, that will make it easier to test. And now uh, you can test that things work fine by running QMU. Uh, QMU with 564 uh, is a way to emulate this executable on your x86 machine. And it works. Now let's choose a platform to run our software and to allow you to run the same steps as I do, I chose a hardware emulator, which is QMU. So I'm going to make the tests with QMU for the 2.1 from Ubuntu 20.04. Um, you install it from the QMU system misc package. And with the minus capital M option, question mark, you can see which boards are available. Um, it emulates real hardware boards, but also um, this interesting vert board um, is, it's what I'm going to choose because it emulates virtual I.O. peripherals instead of emulating real hardware and that's much more efficient. Now I have to explain uh, the boot process and the privileges available on the RISC-V. So uh, RISC-V offers three privileges mo privilege modes. Uh, there is user mode for applications, right? Uh, there's the supervisor mode for the OS, the kernel, and the machine mode for the bootloader and firmware. So, well, essentially you have multiple combinations, but what we, what we want to have here is the firmware uh, in M mode starting uh, an operating system or the bootloader in S mode and then user mode. So in our case, uh, we'll have OpenSBI as the M mode, uh, U-boot in S mode, uh, also starting Linux in S mode. And then of course, from Linux, you'll start applications in user mode. Uh, so then the, the next thing to compile is the U-boot bootloader. So uh, th these are the steps I'll go through. Um, so we need to set a cross-compile environment variable to, to let uh, U-boot know what compiler is going to be used. And these are the steps to compile it. So to compile U-boot, let's get the sources, extract them. Now I need a cross compiler path uh, for uh, U-boot. So um, actually my compiler, uh, if you remember, is cross GCC. So I'm gonna grab this, everything before GCC in the name and put it in the cross compile variable. So I already prepared my environments setting, right, cross compile to do this. So I'm gonna source this new file. Then I can go inside uh, the U-boot sources. I'm going to find the available uh, configurations for RISC-V. And what, the one I want is a QMU uh, emulated uh, board uh, with um, for RISC-V 64, of course, uh, using U-boot in S mode so that it can uh, boot the Linux kernel. It can start the Linux kernel. Otherwise, if you start um, U-boot in M mode, it won't be able to, to start the Linux kernel. So just make no, bad copy paste. There you are. It's a ready-made configuration. And now we can compile U-boot. And since U-Boot is a relatively small program, it will be quite quick. There you are. Nice. Now let's build the firmware that will be used to start U-Boot. So we'll use Open uh, SBI, Open Supervisor a Binary Interface. That's a program that allows to switch from M mode to Supervisor mode. That's uh, what U-Boot uh, runs with. So we clone the project, we compile it this way, and we produce a firmware payload.elf file um, that's containing uh, U-boot. 
So we'll have to run this make command every time there's an update to uBoot. And then uh, there's uh, the command to start QMU and start uBoot. So let's do it. So as the comments are a bit long to type, I pasted them from the presentation. Here they are. Right, so that's a compiling command. There you are, you have the payload um, that is ready to be booted with QMU. So I prepared in the parent directory a run QMU script that actually just does that, emulates a RISC 5 machine with 2 gigabytes of RAM, 8 CPUs, why not, we can, uh, starting the virtual machine, vert machine, uh, no graphics, um, and uh, booting the firmware, that's uh, the firmware payload, that ELF file that we've just compiled. So let's let's try and run it. So you see OpenSBI and uBoot was started, and then well, there's nothing to do yet, but there we are, we have uBoot. Now, let me explain how to build the Linux kernel. So, of course, you need the sources, uh, and this time you need two variables to be set. Cross-compile, as before, with uBoot, and Arch being the name of the subdirectory uh, under Arch, corresponding uh, in the kernel sources, corresponding to the target architecture. So you set export Arch equal uh, risk 5 Then you have to pick up a uh, configuration. Um, so we run make help pipe grep dev config and we find all the dev config files that are provided for RISC 5 The one that's interesting in our case is dev config, which just works fine. It's a generic one. Uh, you also have uh, machine specific uh, dev config files that you could use too if you have uh, some hardware. Uh, then we have a configuration that's ready to use. So we could further customize it by running make menu config. And then to compile, just run make or make minus j8 as before to uh, compile faster and to recompile the, the kernel faster if you recompile over and over again you could use the uh, ccache here so um, instead of directly use this or uh, set the cross compile to ccache and the prefix at the end what you get is uh, the vm linux it's a raw um, kernel in elf format at the top of the kernel sources it's not bootable but you can use it for debugging and ours risk 5 boot image you have the uncompressed bootable kernel uh, and also in the same directory image.gz is the uncompressed bootable uh, kernel so let's start compiling the kernel I already extracted the source archive so there it is uh, now the next step is to set the arch uh, environment variable that will correspond to the subdirectory under arch that we want to compile the kernel with right so it's a risk file so let me modify the environment file and add arch equal risk file now i can run make help uh, more specifically we can look at uh, the dev config options so you can see uh, various options, some for uh, supporting the K210 uh, uh, hardware, for example. Uh, in our case, we'll use the generic one, so dev config. So this gives us a uh, dev default configuration that's good for us. We could further customize the configuration now that with a menu config to change things. But in our case, we're just fine with the default configuration. And then we can just compile the kernel. So let it run for some time. So while Linux is being built, uh, let's see how to boot the kernel. So you could actually directly boot the kernel uh, from QNU. What you have to do is rebuild OpenSBI so that the payload contains the uh, U Linux image, uh, this one, instead of the uBoot image. And then you can just run QNU in the same way, except that you will add minus append uh, passing the kernel command line to Linux. However, in our case, what we want to demonstrate is the normal booting process, so something more realistic to what you have in real, real life. So that's um, where the uh, first stage bootloader starts the bootloader, then starts the kernel, and then starts user space. So to do this, uh, we want to show how to set the uBoot environment to load the Linux kernel and to specify the Linux kernel command line. So for this purpose, we will need some storage space to store the uBoot environment. 
load the kernel binary and also to contain the file system that Linux will boot on. Therefore, let's create a disk image to give some storage space for QMU. So let's first create uh, a 128 megab megabyte disk image with the dd command and then uh, using, we'll use the cfdisk command to create two partitions in this image. Uh, first, a 64 megabyte uh, partition uh, of VAT32 uh, type marked as bootable, and that's what we usually have in, um, in SD cards. And then the second partition with remaining space, uh, that the type will be Linux. Now we can access the partitions in this disk image using the hello setup command uh, that associates a block device like dev loop zero to the image file. What's new here for me, um, I, I've just discovered recently the minus minus part scan command that allows to automatically detect the partitions um, inside a disk image rather than having to uh, manually uh, define offsets and things like that and set up further loop devices for the partitions inside um, the disk image. So that's very convenient. You have loop 2p1 and loop 2p2, which we can now format with normal commands, mkfs.vfat and mkfs.ext4. So let's create this uh, disk image. So dd if equal slash dev slash zero. That's the input file. Of is the output file disk.img uh, number of blocks block size equal 1m and 128 blocks right now using cfdisk to format uh, I find cfdisk quite convenient because uh, to create partitions I mean, it's very convenient very easy intuitive to use so choosing a DOS partition table the uh, original format so from the free space, I can create a new partition uh, of uh, 64M primary. I set it to bootable. Usually, sometimes that's useful, especially when you have real hardware. Right? You can see that it's bootable uh, with the uh, asterisk here. And then the type is important too can be important, so I'll use the FAT32 type. Right, this one. Uh, actually, you don't see it because it's hidden by my picture, uh, but it's on. It's there on the left, on the right. And then, new. So with the remaining space, I create a Linux partition, which that is primary. So this is done. Now I can write the partition table, and I say yes. And I can quit and I can confirm this with the fdisk command. You can see the various partitions that I have and the their types. So let's use the hello setup command to access our partitions in the disk image. There we are. So you can see the partitions uh, p1 and p2. Now we can actually uh, format them. So um, sudo mkfs that be fat for the first one it would be uh, fat32 that uh, bootloaders understand. Well actually the U-boot is more powerful than that. Um, <laughs> but that's the usual case. So uh, we specify a name that will be a label so we can call it boot and the block device p1 right and then sudo mkfs.x4 this time with a label that's not the same terminology call it rootfs dev uh, loop to p2 there we are Hey, our kernel base is over now. Um, it took about two, mi two minutes, which is not that bad. Uh, we have our image file now that's generated. Uh, we also have the image.gz file. Unfortunately, I haven't managed to boot it yet. Uh, that's an issue that's worth investigating, of course. So now that the kernel image is ready, let's copy it to our fat partition. Of course, 
then unmount to save changes. There we are. So now we want to recompile the boot to add support for uh, finding its environment in a fat partition on the vertio disk. So let's reconfigure you put accordingly, so specifying that the environment will be in a FAT partition, uh, that uh, the FAT will be in a vertio device, and we will use the first partition from uh, the first vertio device. So then we recompile you boot and update the firmware loader. And now the last thing we have to do is add uh, some options to Premio to add uh, a disk drive corresponding to our disk image. So Here's the command line, and at the end we'll, uh, we'll be able to boot, uh, you boot, and uh, check that the save and command works. So let's start my new uh, QMU command. Oh, there we are, we are in boot. Let's try to save an environment for Apple. Yes, it works. So let's try to exit QMU and start it again and see if the environment is still there. Yes, it is. And actually, we can do a fat ls on vertio 01. And you can see there is a new uboot.env file that was created. Great, that's exactly what we want. So now we are ready to start uh, booting Linux from uboot. So to boot Linux from uboot, uh, uboot needs uh, several things. First, it needs, uh, of course, uh, a Linux kernel image to load. So we will load it from our virtual, virtual I.O. disk to RAM. And actually, you can find a suitable RAM address by using the bdinfo command in uboot that shows the start and end of RAM. So it's fat load, vert I.O., first disk, first partition, target address, and the file to load. Uh, possibly we can also load the image of an initramfs. It's a file system in RAM, in RAM that Linux can use. We don't use it in this demo. Um, and last but not least, of course, a device tree binary that lets the kernel know which SOC, which uh, CPU and devices we have. This allows the same kernel to support many different SOCs and boards at the same time. Uh, normally the TB files are uh, compiled from DTS files in Arch, RISC-V or architecture, boot DTS. However, in our case, there was no DTS file for the RISC-V uh, QMU board, and I was uh, a bit puzzled by that. Uh, fortunately, I got help from the Linux RISC-V mailing list that explained that actually the, um, the bootloader is the, sorry, the DTB is built by QMU and passed by, uh, by to, uh, to OpenSBI and then to uBoot. So you can actually access this uh, loaded DTB at uh, an address in um, uboot that's stored in FTD control address. The second thing we need to do is set the Linux command line arguments. Uh, as shown here, the first one is root equal slash dev slash VDA2. It tells uh, Linux to uh, try to uh, mount the root file system from the second partition of the virtual disk. Another one is root wait. Uh, waiting for the root device to be ready before trying to mount it. This is sometimes useful. Uh, the next one is very important. It uh, directs uh, the Linux kernel booting messages to the first serial line. Uh, if you got it wrong, you may have no message at all. Um, another useful one is early con equal SBI. This allows to have more booting messages even before the console driver is initialized. That's called early con. So finally, here is the command to boot the Linux image file that we built. Uh, bootai, Linux address, intramfs address, dtb address. So in our case, it's bootai, uh, the address where we loaded the kernel, dash, because there's no initramfs, and the dtb address. So as we want to do that every time we boot, we are going to define the boot command environment variable, which automates, uh, which is run automatically um, by uBoot after a configurable delay. That it is. Um, and of course, we need to uh, save the new settings with the save and command. So let's do it now. So I start the emulator again, All right? Stop the uh, countdown and then set the boot arcs, All right? Then we set the boot command. There we are. We save the two new settings, All right? And then we can boot. Boot means running the bootcmd command. And there it goes. 
it's working. So it mounted the, the root file system as instructed. It's just uh, failing to uh, execute an init process and that's okay because we haven't filled the root file system yet. So that's the next step. So now I will show you how to build the root file system. So we will use BusyBox, which implements many uh, command line utilities in one executable. So that's what it was like 10 years ago. And in 2019, it was already uh, many more commands. So it's growing, uh, people keep uh, improving it. So to compile it, uh, get the sources, extract them. So that you get the sources from busybox.net. We'll start by configuring it with make all no config, which makes sure that nothing is selected and uh, it's easier to just add the commands that you want. In build options, we'll uh, compile, instruct busybox to be compiled as a static binary. Uh, this way there are no um, libraries, shared libraries to manipulate that's easier to get started with. And we will also set the cross compiler. As you can see here, the cross compiler is set in the um, configuration interface. And then I'll go on and select uh, enable support for various commands that I will need in my demo. So to compile it, it's make minus J uh, as usual. You see that uh, the size is very small, uh, a bit less than 300,000 bytes. And it's funny to see that we're using a 64-bit system to run such small programs. Uh, then you, uh, we run make install that will create an install and underscore install directory like this with, uh, as you can see, there's a single executable that's busybox and there's the directory structure bin, uh, sbin and user, user bin, user sbin and then all the executables in there are just symbolic links to busybox so there's just one executable at the end and then at the end we will actually replicate this underscore install directory to our second partition of our virtual disk drive so that's what we do here so I'm going to actually show you um, what I did exactly by uh, showing you the Askinema recording of the session for once Okay, so this is, uh, this is Askinema's recording of uh, compiling BusyBox. So let's play it. So I need to play here. Okay, and I'll comment what I'm doing. So here you get uh, the BusyBox command line. So I can actually, uh, source archive. So actually, uh, again, Askinema is not a video, it's uh, ASCII. So you could copy and paste things right here. Uh, and copy the, uh, the source location of the BusyBox archive and paste it elsewhere uh, or re reuse my commands. So that's really nice. Really nice. So now I extract uh, the BusyBox archive. The first thing I do is run make all no config to deselect everything. All right, and now. Um, I'm going to configure BusyBox for um, static build. There you are. And also set the cross compiler prefix to RISC 564 uh, dash Linux dash. So that's the prefix. We set it in, in the configuration now, not in the environment. And now I'm going to add support for multiple um, applications, uh, commands. The first one I'm looking for is ash. It's a shell, lightweight shell. Then the next one I'm looking for is init, so it's in init utilities, right, there it is, so it has various uh, features that I keep. I also need the halt command, there it is. Then I'm going to move and look for uh, the mount command, there it is. I disable the few features I don't need. That's the nice thing about BusyBox. Then I'm going to look for uh, core utils such as cat, etc. So I disable things. No, I don't. Uh, I need echo. I'm also looking for mkdir, and here I'm losing a bit of time because uh, it's not in the right alphabetical order. So I got confused. So I'm still looking for it. So MKD, oh yes, it's in core utils, so I should find it. So I eventually go through um, the list again. 
and there it is all right then I'm looking for more commands such as uh, ls okay ls I, I can disable a few commands that I know I won't use then I'm looking for uptime and I, it's hard to guess where it's going to be so actually it's in process utilities there it is uptime the next one I want is VI the editor so this one is easy to find because it's in editors you see you have very basic editors arc is considered as an editor um, right and the next one is a uh, HTTP and HTTP server so there's one here and I'm gonna disable a few features I know that I want to use and then uh, I want uh, I have config as well so it's next so I'm just looking at some uh, options. Yes, I have config, right? Looking at the options. Okay, so I'm done. Now I can save my configuration and run make to build BusyBox. And there it is. So let's look at the size. Ah, less than 300 kilobytes. Let's install it now. So it actually uh, creates a directory structure under the under the underscore install directory. And that's uh, what I told you. I would we would have all the links to be in BusyBox. And we're done. So here, uh, feel free to uh, follow the link on my slides and also play the video by yourself. Uh, just to the, I mean the ASCII video by yourself. That's a nice experience. So now let's install BusyBox in our uh, virtual hard drive. So first let's create a mount point. Then mount, never forget sudo. Remember it's loop 2p2 into MNT rootfs. And then I just need to, I just have to replicate The contents of underscore install into mnt rootfs there we are at unmount and now i can try to run qmu again there we are it works so here we are missing one thing we need to add a dev directory uh, we haven't created it so now let's create the missing directory so We mount the device again. Um, sudo mkdir mnt rootfs dev. Uh, while we're doing it, we are going to also create proc and sys, which will be useful uh, as mount point for the proc and sysfs file systems. All right. Okay, so now let's save our changes now and boot Linux there we are it worked um, so now uh, that's good we can use uh, Linux we have booted it we've booted it uh, now we can try some commands such as mount you see mount doesn't fully work because proc is not mounted yet so I want to add it proc, proc. if you type mount again there it works and similarly we should um, uh, mount the sysfs file system uh, and of course we don't want to do that manually every time so we are going the next thing to do is automate all this so to automate the mounting of proc and sys uh, what we can do is create uh, a tc init tab file uh, first to configure busybook in it the first thing uh, we specify is the execution of an rcs uh, script uh, at system initialization 
and also start a shell on the console. So as first means um, asking for uh, to press a key before starting the shell so that we don't start the shell when there's nobody uh, paid attention to that shell. Uh, so if you want to know more about the uh, 18 tab syntax, you'll find uh, some uh, documentation in Busybox with there's an example in tab with lots of comments explaining what the different fields are. Then we just have to create the uh, RCS script that automates things at startup. So it looks like this. So a few uh, common mistakes that you may find. Uh, don't uh, forget to make the RCS script executable. Uh, Linux won't allow to execute it otherwise. Uh, don't forget uh, the hash um, exclamation mark or shebang uh, bnsh at the beginning of shell scripts. Otherwise, uh, Linux doesn't know how to execute uh, such a, such an executable. It doesn't know that it is a shell script. And don't forget to uh, effectively to uh, specify the execution of a shell uh, in init tab or at the end of etc init.trcs. Otherwise execution will just stop and you won't have any way to interact uh, with the machine and, and type more commands. So now we can make our own changes directly on the target. So let's do it. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to um, make the root file system uh, read write. So let's change the command line. Just need to add read write, otherwise it's read only. And you can't make changes therefore. Okay, let's uh, create the now etc init tab and etc init.drcs. So mkds slash etc, vi slash etc. It's good to have vi now. There we are. And also create etc init.drcs. Oh, it's of course my mistake. Uh, there's no, uh, there's poor editing here, so just init the D first, and VI. Uh, these are the one, the, the here. These are warnings from the random generator. Since we're working from um, the console, we have sometimes have kernel warnings in the editors or in the command line. So commands to mount proc and sys every time we boot. There we are. We need to make it uh, executable, otherwise it won't work. Oh, bad editing. I did enable again the uh, all the editing features of the shells. Right, and now we should be good to go. Uh, so uh, we can help the machine to, to shut down the machine cleanly. Right, and then go back. Right, it works now. Uh, Sys and proc were mounted automatically, so everything worked. So the last thing we want to do is add a web server interface to our emulated machine. We do that by adding two lines to QMU and running QMU as um, root through the sudo command so that it can bring up the network interface. On the target machine, we will have to um, use ifconfig-a to find the available network interfaces. That would be ETL0, we'll set an IP address this way. And similarly, on the host machine, we'll set an IP address to the networking connection between the QMU and the host, tab, tab 2, with this IP address. And we'll check that the ping works between the host and the emulated machine. Um, on the target 2, we will create a www directory that will act as a home directory for the web server. And inside this, we'll create a CGI bin uptime script that uh, will, will have those contents. So when you um, execute it, it will output some HTTP headers first, some HTML code, and then uh, in the middle of that, the output of the uptime command, showing that we can remotely execute command commands on uh, the target system. This will actually happen as the um, CGI bin uptime 
page will have a CGI bin in its uh, URL. And when this happens, the BusyBox HTTP server actually, instead of serving the contents of this file, actually executes it and sends its output to the client. That's how it works. So on the target machine, I will have to add to the RCS file the starting of the HTTP D server. And on the host machine, I will open the above URL, the below URL in the browser. Well, to save some time, and as I already showed you what to do, I'm just showing you the results here. So that's a, a page that refreshes itself every one second, showing the time the device has been booted. So that's exactly the uptime information from our um, web server. There we are. Hey, it's getting time to conclude. I realize I exceeded the 45 minutes uh, by a few minutes. But I got carried away by the Beagle 5 announcement. Come on, guys. Anyway, after 45 minutes, remember, we already had a system booting Linux and uh, running executables. So that's not that bad. So what to remember? Embedded Linux is just made out of simple components. This makes it easier to get started with Linux. You just need a toolchain, a bootloader, a kernel, and a few executables, and you're, you're good to go, right? RISC 5 is a new open instruction set architecture. Uh, we invite you to use it and support it. And another thing is in embedded Linux, things don't change that much over time. You just get more commands, more features, but what you learned in the past is still true, is still valid. That's nice. All right, uh, to finish this presentation, I'd like to share some references and express some gratitude. The first reference is Drew Fastini's unmatched presentation about Linux on RISC-V. Here's a link to the latest one I know about. If you're interested in learning more about embedded Linux, you could actually check out uh, the freely available materials of our embedded Linux system development course. That's more than 500 pages. Um, and more generally, you could check out Bootlin all all Bootlin presentations and training materials that are found on bootlin.com slash doc, all available in a free documentation license as well. If you want to know more, you could also uh, visit the embedded Linux wiki that contains presentation, how to's. Um, and if you wish to find some place where to contribute your knowledge, that's the place to go. And then last but not least, very special gratitude to Heert Euterhoven, my mentor in conference fashion, always wearing a smile and having always the most relevant and elegant conference t-shirts. I'm impressed. Well, there we are. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience, having digested more than 60 slides in uh, less than an hour. Uh, now it's time for questions, uh, share your suggestions, also some comments. So let's chat a little bit, if you wish, uh, until the, um, the conference time is completely over. Thank you again. Bye-bye. And enjoy for them.